I was broke. And so my parents, they'd be like, all right, let's go to the store. Let's get something for so-and-so, and I will pay for it. And my parents were getting me gifts, right? So they loved me, and they're like, hey, I'm going to help you out. We'll get this gift with my money. You can pick it out and show love to them. Well, what do you think my parents would do if we went to the store and they said, hey, you can use my money and get a gift for your sibling. And what you did was you bought this, like, super menacing snake. And you know your sister hates snakes. And you get the snake, and the snake is going to attack her and all this stuff. And you're like, no, like, your parents aren't going to do that. They're going to be like, no, your sister, you're not going to get your sister a snake. She hates snakes. She's going to cry if you do that. Or maybe you're like, oh, I, I know my parents gave me this money, but I'm going to go get myself a video game, and I'm not going to get anyone Christmas presents. What's, what are your parents going to do? They're going to be like, nope, I'm taking my money back, and you get none of it, right? Well, oh, there's a music stand there. Um, in a similar way, God has shown us love, right? He's given us a gift that we did not deserve, and he gave us that gift so that we could then love him and love others, right? God did not give us love. He did not show us love so that we could keep it for ourselves and be happy and enjoy it for ourselves, but then be cruel to other people and hate other people, right? He, he saved us so that we could love others. And in the same way, our parents, like, they give you money to get a gift. They don't get you the money so that you can go be cruel to your siblings or just treat yourself. It's like, no, so you can love your siblings. And God has shown us love, not so that we can hate the people around us and just have a good life for ourselves. No, he wants us to love others. It is an impossible to experience God's love, to claim to love him at, at the same time, hate your brother, right? I can't say, okay, I'm going to get gifts from my siblings, my parents give me money, and then I go and I hate them with it, right? God doesn't love us and then say, okay, I've loved you, now go love others, and then you hate others. It's like oil and water. They don't mix. It's like ketchup and ranch. They shouldn't mix. It's like M&Ms and Skittles. Don't mix them. None of these things should mix or coexist. And saying that you love God, saying that you are a follower of God, and then hating your brother, it doesn't mix. It doesn't add up. John is writing to these believers because he wants them to have assurance of faith, he wants them to be walking in the light, right? We've been talking all about this, and he's writing to believers who are walking in the light, and he wants them to have assurance of that faith. He wants to encourage them. He says, hey, remember the things that you've heard from Jesus. Remember the things you've been taught, and if you're doing those things, keep doing them. Keep going and be encouraged. You're in the light. Don't listen to these heretics who are saying, oh, you're not truly of God because we have this secret truth, and really, Jesus isn't God. Or really, you can sin all you want and still be a Christian. It's great. There are all these lies going around, and John is saying, no, this is the truth. Remember what you've been taught. You've been doing the truth. Keep doing it, and be assured. So he's writing these things to them to be encouraged, and so this is another passage of that where he's saying, hey, if you're loving your brothers as God has loved you, be encouraged. You're in the Lord. Have assurance of faith. But if you say you're in the Lord, and you're hating your brothers, something's not adding up. If you say, hey, mom and dad, I need some money to go get my siblings a gift, and then you go buy a snake that's going to terrorize your sister, something's not adding up, right? So that's what we're going to dive into tonight. So with that, let's go to our passage, 1 John 2, 7 through 11, and it says this. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So John opens this passage and he says, beloved. So why does he use that word? If I'm, whenever you write a note to someone, you, you may say, dear Johnny, or maybe you say, Johnny, formally I'm writing to you, or sincerely, or whatever, right? You, when you address someone, 
there's purpose to it. If I respond, if I go to Pastor Ben, I call him Pastor Ben because I respect him. He's my shepherd. He's my pastor. And I go to him in that way. Or, you know, maybe you go to someone, you say teacher because they're your teacher for school or your mom or your dad. You don't go and call your parents by their first names or hopefully you don't. You call them mom or dad, right? And so John, when he's writing here, he has a specific reason for calling them beloved. And why does he use that word? Well, beloved it carries the idea of chosen by God and loved by God. They are dear to John, right? So these people aren't just random people who are walking in sin. They're not walking in darkness. They're not against the church. They are people who have been chosen by God. They're loved by God, and they're lo- John loves them too. They're in Christ, and that's who he's writing to. And what he's doing is he's saying, remember, remember that God loves you, And remember that you love God, that you've been called to new life in this love. So then going from beloved, he says this, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. So what what is he saying there, right? What is this old commandment? What is this that they have heard? Well, what he's saying is, hey, remember the gospel message that you heard preached to you, right? A lot of these people may have been even alive and heard Jesus himself give the gospel call to repent, believe, and follow him, right? So he's saying, remember what you've heard in the past. This is not some new information. I'm not telling you stuff like mind-blowing. I had no idea I'm supposed to love my neighbor. No, he's like, hey, you've heard this. Jesus talked about these things. I'm writing to you to remember. So in this, and as we're listening, right, a lot of you guys have heard the gospel. You've heard to love God. You've heard love others. And so this is not new stuff to you, but we need to be reminded of this constantly. Uh, Yeah, and when he says the old commandment is the word that you have heard, he's talking about the gospel. So then let's go ahead and look at a couple of cross-references for that. 1 John 3.23, just a couple of pages over, he says, and this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. So that's the command, right? Love God and love others. Jesus commanded us to love one another. That's the command that he's talking about. If you want another cross-reference, it's just 1 John 2, 1 through 6. We looked at that the last time we were together when he says, I'm writing you no new commandment. Well, it's all the things that he's just been writing. He's saying, right, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's the propitiation for our sins, right? Remember what propitiation is? Jesus took our place to bear the wrath of God when we should have been taking that wrath because of our sins. And he's saying, whoever follows him and walks in the light, whoever keeps his commandments, God's love is perfected in that person. In verse 6, underline this verse. This is so key to all of 1 John. He says, whoever says he abides in him, him being Christ, ought to walk in the same way in which he walked, right? If we're claiming to be in Christ, if we're claiming to be followers of God and having communion with him, we should be walking in the same way that Christ walked. Christ is our ultimate assurance, but then our lives should reflect that. So underline that verse that is key When John says, I'm writing these things to you, this is no new commandment. That's what he's talking about, walking like Christ walked. But then John goes on to say, okay, I'm not just writing to you an old commandment, but I'm also writing to you a new commandment. So he just said old, but now it's new. So is he contradicting himself? It's like, John, make up your mind. Is it old? Is it new? Come on, explain it to me. So what he means is this, okay. It's old in the sense that God has always had the character of love, right? He has always commanded his people to love him and love others. If you go to Deuteronomy 6, 5, write that down as a cross-reference, Deuteronomy 6, 5, it says this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. If you go to Leviticus 19, 18, or write this down and you can look later, Leviticus 19, 18, It says, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord, right? So in one sense, this commandment is very old, right? 
God doesn't contradict himself. God doesn't change. He has always commanded his people to love. And more than that, right, Jesus gave the command, and it's like, all right, the first time you heard the gospel, the old commandment, these things that you've heard from the beginning, it's old in that sense, but then it's new in the sense that, sorry, it's new in the sense that it is continually being fleshed out, right? He says in verse 8, at the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and true in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining, right? So it's an ongoing thing where this love that people are supposed to be showing to others, it's always growing and it's expanding and it's going out into the world. Christ lived out that command showing us how we should keep it, right? So all this time in the Old Testament saying, love your neighbor as yourself, love the Lord your God, but can they love him perfectly? No, because they don't have the Holy Spirit. And even we can't love him perfectly, but Christ has given us an example. So put this down for point number one. Remind yourself daily of the love that God has shown you. Remind yourself daily of the love that God has shown you. And go ahead and look at me, look at verses 7 and 8 with me. It, it's right there. It says, Beloved, I'm writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Right, so what is John doing here? He's reminding them. He's saying, hey, remember what you've heard from the beginning. Remember the commandments that Jesus gave to us. Remember that you're beloved by God. And remember Christ's example. And remember that this is not just some old thing that passed away. No, it's new in the sense that it continues on. We are constantly supposed to be loving God, loving others, and it should constantly be growing and expressing itself in our lives. And Jesus even claimed that this was a new commandment. If you look at John 13, 34, he says this, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another, right? So Jesus even says, this commandment I give that you love God and love others, new commandment. And it's also new in the sense that Christ gave us that perfect example because he came and lived on this earth and he showed us what it should look like to love God with your whole heart. He showed us what it should look like to love others, love your neighbor as yourself. And Christ demonstrated that throughout his whole life, death, and resurrection. If you go over just a couple chapters to John 15, John 15, 12, and 17, you can write those down. John 15, 12, and 17, he says this, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And then just a few verses later, he says this, These things I command you, so that you will love one another. Right, so John, one of the disciples, he heard Jesus constantly talking about these things. Anyone who has heard the gospel knows that at the core of the gospel, you repent of your sins and you turn and you love God. And because you love God, you're going to love others. So remember these things. Remember these commandments. Well, what does that look like, right? When we say remind ourselves daily of the love that God has shown us. John is reminding them. So what does that look like for us to remind ourselves daily of the love that God has shown us? And why is that important? Well, maybe it's looking at the example that Christ has given us. If you go to a place like Philippians 2, 5 through 8, right, Pastor Ben has preached on this, and he says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human, human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So Jesus showed love towards us because he laid aside his glory. He laid aside all of these things and he took on flesh, weak human flesh, and he came and lived among us, right? He dealt with all of this fallen world, pain, suffering, sadness. He dealt with all of those things. He died on the cross out of a love for us, even though we didn't deserve that love. Right, Jesus also showed examples when he says, hey, love your neighbor as yourself. 
you can look at examples of that. If you look at Mark 10, 21, Jesus showed love in this way. He said, Jesus, looking at him, this was the rich young ruler. So he's talking, this guy says, hey, what must I do to be saved? And he says, Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. So how does that show love? Well, this rich young ruler, right, Jesus loved him so much that he wanted this person to know God and be like, be like Christ. He wanted him to be a follower of Christ. And so in love, he spoke the truth, right? Love can be speaking the truth. He said, hey, you lack this one thing. You need to give it everything away. Would it, it would not be loving for me to lie to you, right? If you had like some gross chocolate smudge on your cheek and you're about to go lead worship up here with Ilya, it would not be loving for me to just, oh, you look great, like go up there and like you got this huge chocolate smudge and you just, Jesus, thank you, right? That's not loving. I would say, hey, you might want to go wa- wash off the chocolate because that's loving. I'm going to tell you the truth. And in a much more serious way, Jesus says, hey, you have this sin problem, this one thing you lack. You love your money way too much. Give everything you have away and come follow me. So Jesus showed that example of, of love. Jesus showed what it looks like to love God in that he kept the commandments perfectly. Right? John 15, 9. As the Father has loved me, so I have, have I loved you. Abide in my love. Ephesians 5, 2. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. 1 John 3. 16, by this we know love that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers, right? So we see example after example where Christ kept God's commandments. Christ gave up his life for us and this is what love looks like. Christ showed sacrificial love in so many ways. He prayed for his disciples, right? You see constant examples where he's praying to the Father and saying, sanctify and keep my disciples, keep them, preserve them, and don't let this world get to them, right? You see, Christ washed his disciples' feet. He provided food for them. He gave them the truth, right? Christ came, and he told them the truth. He told them the way to know God, to be right with God, because that's what love is, is telling people the truth, right? Christ gave them an example. He gave us an example. He said, this is how you need to live and follow me, and ultimately, Christ gave his life for them and for us. That is the greatest act of love is laying down your life. So how can we apply this? We're saying, okay, remind yourself daily of the love of Christ. John is writing, he's reminding them, hey, beloved, this is an old commandment I'm writing to you. It's not anything new. I'm reminding you of these things. So we should be reminding ourselves of the love of God. How do we do that and why do we do that? Well, how do we do that? We can do it through examples like what we just did. We went to a lot of different cross-references. I know you, there were a lot, so I'm sorry. Um, but just going through the scriptures and you can see, okay, I can look at all these examples of Christ and how he loved and sacrificed himself for me. We didn't deserve this love, guys, but Christ gave us that love. So we can look at examples of Christ's love for us. We can also look at Christ's examples, Christ's example of loving the Father. He loved the Father perfectly. He always wanted to please the Father. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, about to die, he said, not my will, but your will be done. If possible, let this cup pass from me, because he knew the intense suffering and pain that was about to come. But he said, not my will, but your will, because he loved God so much, right? So we can look at Christ's example throughout scriptures. So each day, maybe you're looking at a different example of how Christ showed love and demonstrated love, right? We can sing songs of praise. Jesus, thank you. You know, sing that in the morning and think about the wrath of God completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy now seated at your table, right? I don't know if you guys have ever had an intense enemy. You guys all seem pretty nice, like you would not have enemies. But if there was someone that you hated or they hated you, they hated your guts and they just wanted to see everything about your life ruined, imagine inviting that person like, hey, come sit down with me. Like, let's have lunch together. Like, let me buy you lunch. You're my friend now. Can you, like, it's hard to imagine that, but that's what God has done for us. Another thing that you can do is, how can you apply this? Uh, 
is your obedience because you love God, right? When you understand what God has done for you, when you understand the love that he has shown you, you can't help but want to live for him and love him. We love because he first loved us. And you can't help but want to go and tell others about that love, right? I don't know if you guys have ever experienced this. Sometimes AJ will, like, surprise me and give me a really nice gift. Like, recently she just got me this coffee grinder. And I was, like, super surprised, super excited. And, like, I wanted to be, like, extra nice to her. Like, I was doing extra chores, extra dishes just to show my appreciation. Not to, like, earn the gift, but just, like, thank you so much. You're the best. I love you so much. Let me, like, go clean all the dishes. You just relax. I'll take care of our dog because he's a mess, everything like that, just because I love her, right? And out of our thankfulness to God for what he's done for us, we want to respond and say, Lord, I love you. Like, I want to obey you. I want to show my thankfulness for all that you've done. Right, so then we get into, well, what is one of the main ways that we express that love? If God has loved us, and if we love God, how do we express that love most plainly? Well, this is where John explains it's in loving others, right? And that's how, that's one of the ways that we can have assurance of faith is in loving others. So put this down for point number two, love others purposefully with the love that God has shown you. Love others purposefully with the love that God has shown you. And we can see that in verses 9 through 11, so look at those with me. It says, Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Right, so you may ask, okay, who is my brother? Who is my neighbor? We have examples of people asking this. Um, in the example of the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? If you write down this reference, you can go read it later. We're not going to read it now. But Luke 10, 29 through 37. Luke 10, 29 through 37. Someone, so... A guy, basically desiring to justify himself, said, Jesus, who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied and gave the example of the Good Samaritan, right? So there's this guy, he's going on a journey down to Jericho, and along the way, robbers come, they beat him up, take all his stuff, and leave him for dead on the side of the road, right? And then a priest comes along, and the priests are highly esteemed, right? This would be like a pastor um, in their times, walks along the road, and sees the guy and just keeps walking past like, nope, not going to take care of him because I don't want to be unclean. Uh, then a Levite comes by, and a Levite would be maybe more like, you know, maybe a worship leader or an associate pastor, someone who's still serving in the temple and still esteemed as a holy man. You would think, oh, surely one of these people who is one of God's servants, surely they would take care of this person who's left for dead on the side of the road. But he just walks by, doesn't do anything. And then this Samaritan, right? So a Samaritan, the Samaritans did not get along with the Jews. They, they fought a lot. They, didn't, they would literally walk tons of miles out of, out of the way just so that they wouldn't have to go through the Samaritan towns. They wanted nothing to do with the Samaritans. But this guy, he's walking along, and he sees this guy, and he goes and he takes care of him. He has compassion on the guy. He takes him cleans his wounds, puts him in a hotel, pays for his food. He says, hey, here's all this money. If it's not enough, I'll pay and cover everything when I come back. And Jesus shows that this guy showed love. This was his neighbor, right? His neighbors were the people in his sphere of influence who he came into contact with, right? So you may be, your neighbors are your siblings, your parents, you know, maybe your friends. Maybe it's literally the people who are your neighbors, like living on either side of your house. It could be someone that you come into contact with. Like if you were at the store and you saw someone sobbing in the aisle, maybe go ask them and say, hey, what's going on? And you c that's an opportunity to show love. Um, so your neighbors are those people. And then in Mark 3, 33 through 35, Mark 3, 33 through 35, um, 
these people came up to Jesus and said, hey, your brothers and your mother, they're looking for you. And Jesus answered them, who are my mothers and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. So was Jesus confused and saying, oh, th- this is my mom and these are my brothers? No, he's metaphorically speaking. Like he knows who his physical mother was. It was Mary, right, or his physical brothers. But what he's saying is his family those who are his spiritual family, those who he's closest to, they're those who do the will of God. And so in First John here, when he's talking about whoever loves his brother, when he's saying, okay, who are our brothers? Who is he talking about here? First and foremost, he's talking about those who are part of our church family, right? Those who profess to be followers of Christ, those who are doing the will of God, those are our brothers. But by extension, those are not the only people that you should love. You should also love anyone that you come into contact with. We should not withhold the love of God from anyone. Maybe someone looks different than you. Maybe they talk different or they believe different things, but it doesn't mean that we should withhold that love from those people. Just think about who Christ loved, right? Christ loved tax collectors. He loved murderers. He loved people who were on vastly different sides of the political spectrum of that day. Christ showed love to all of these people. But what was that love, right? Because we hear love thrown around all the time in our society. There's romantic love. There's love in the sense of like friendship love. There's, we say love yourself. You know, like we hear love thrown around in so many different ways. So let's define what we're talking about. When we say love your brothers, or love God, what are we talking about? Well, love, as we're defining it, is to show selfless self-sacrifice, even unto death. Love is showing selfless self-sacrifice, even unto death. Or you could put it down another way. Love is when you desire what's best for a person, and you're willing to sacrifice even your life to achieve their best interest. Right? So you love, when you love someone, it means you care about them and you desire what's best for that person. And you're willing to sacrifice anything, even your life, to achieve that best interest for that person. Right? That's what we're talking about when we're talking about love here. And we see the perfect example of this in God himself. Right? Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, right? So what was, our, what was for our best interest? Our best interest, what we needed, we, need, we needed someone to pay for our sins. We needed someone who could help us to obey God. We, need, we needed someone who could help us to have life. We needed someone to make the relationship right. We needed so much help. That, and so our best interest was someone who could pay for our sins. Our best interest is someone who would mediate, right? Who would be our representative to God, who would say, hey, I'm with him. We needed someone who could help us to obey God. We needed someone who could be a perfect example of how we should live. We needed someone who could make the relationship right and pay for our sins. That's what we needed. And so Christ, knowing what we needed, was willing to give his own life to make that happen. That is what love is, right? Maybe some other examples. Um, So AJ, maybe she needs to wake up super early for work the next day, and our dog is barking and needs to go to the bathroom. Well, Mondays are my day off, so I can sleep in, and I really don't want to wake up. I don't want to go down and take my dog and go outside and wait for him to go to the bathroom and take him back in because it is freezing cold. But I know that AJ needs her sleep because if she does not get sleep, she's going to get sick and then she's going to be miserable and she's going to have to teach kids all day. And so her best interest is getting sleep. And so I'm going to sacrifice what I want. I want to sleep in, but I'm going to sacrifice what I want to go and take care of our dog, even though it is the last thing I want to do, right? Or maybe your parents, they know what's best for you, right? They, They want to raise you to be awesome adults someday. And they know that you need your sleep. 
So they're going to say, no, you cannot stay up till 2 a.m. playing Fortnite, even though you really want to, because they have your best interest in mind. They love you, and so they're, they're willing to sacrifice happiness. They know that you're going to hate them and be like, you're so lame and so boring. Like, I just want to play Fortnite and have fun. And they're going to, you may get mad at them, and they're willing to sacrifice that and deal with the headache of that because they love you and they want your best interest. Or maybe it could be something like, what they feed you. Maybe you really, all you want to eat is a diet of pizza rolls and Kool-Aid and cosmic brownies. That sounds amazing. Anyone wants to eat that, right? No. Um, But your parents, they know what's best for you. They know that you need vegetables. They know that you need protein, all these things. And so they say, no, we're not going to get that. This is what's best for you. Or the fact that your parents, they stay up through all hours of the night just to take care of you when you're sick. We have another awesome example, all of our small group leaders, right? They show love for you guys because they know what your best interest is that you're more like Christ. The goal and the best interest of everyone is that we would all love God and love others, right? That is what is most important. They care about your souls. And so what do they do? They sacrifice every Sunday night to be here, right? They could be out doing other things like time is valuable, but they choose to be here. They choose to spend money to get you guys food and to be here and do things. They, they give of their emotions. Sometimes you guys can be a lot and it's exhausting. Sometimes they're heavy burdens. Sometimes you guys are struggling with things and that can weigh heavy. Like we guys, we care about you guys so much and there's a lot. Like they have their own families. They have their own burdens. They have their own things to take care of, but they love you. They care that you love God. They want you to love God. They want you to love others. And so they sacrifice of their time. They sacrifice of their money. They sacrifice of their emotions. They sacrifice their energy to like to be here to pour into you guys to love you. That's that's what love looks like. That is sacrifice for your best interest. So what do we do? Um, How do we love others practically? I challenge you guys, if you have time this week, which hopefully you all do, do this for me, okay? Write down this reference, 1 Corinthians 13, okay, 1 Corinthians 13, and go home and, s- and make a list of all of the ways that you can show love based on 1 Corinthians 13. Write down, okay, th- Paul says that if I do this, this is what love looks like. If I love someone, I won't do this. And go down that whole list and then look at your life and say, okay, which, which two or three are the biggest issues, right? Like in 1 Corinthians 13, it says love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. Okay, well, I really struggle with being rude. I just like to be rude. I like to be in your face and rude about it. So maybe r- rudeness is the biggest issue that you need to work on because we are all called to be more like Christ, right? When we're reminding ourselves of the love that God has shown us, when we're reminding ourselves of the example of Christ, when we look at Christ and how he lived, we should be trying to be like Christ in the way that we love God and love others. Christ wasn't rude, okay? Christ spoke the truth and he was very honest and people may have been like, oh, you're rude because you're saying something I don't like, but that's not rude. Rudeness is just being unkind to people with your words or attitude or whatever. So go home this week, read 1 Corinthians 13, make a list, right? And in here we see so much that love is all of these different things. It's kind, it's selfless, it's meek, humble, gentle. It prioritizes others. It's forgiving, right? And Paul is saying, hey, you could have all these fancy spiritual gifts. You could speak in tongues, you could speak in prophecies, because those were things at that time people were like, oh, if you have those gifts, you're a pretty special, important role in the church, is what they thought, right? So it'd be like the equivalent of like, oh, Pastor Ben is a really good pastor and a really good preacher. Like, that's the type of gift I want to have. But if you don't have love, it doesn't matter. You could give the best sermon, but if you don't have love, if you don't care about people's lives and being more like Christ, it doesn't matter. We talk about sacrifice, right? So if I see that you have no food, you haven't had food in a week, right? There is a need there, right? And so I could give you a hundred bucks to go get food, but if I don't have love for you, if I'm not caring about your best interest, it gains me nothing, right? Sacrifice, because I could go and I could take our dog out to go potty, 
right? And I could be mad at AJ the whole time, like have a super bad attitude, huffing and puffing, like, Ugh, like, and she's going to feel bad. She's going to like, no, I'm just going to do it because you're making such a big stink about it, right? But that's not love and sacrifice, right? That's sacrifice, but that's not loving sacrifice. And that gets us to the second half of these verses, right? So we've, we've talked about love. We've talked about what it looks like. Well, what's the opposite? He says, hey, if you're in Christ, but you hate your brother, then you're not truly in the light. So what is hate, right? Because again, you guys are a really sweet, awesome group of kids. You guys are all really easy to be around. It's really fun hanging out with you guys. You all are from great Christian families. You're very kind. And so hate may not look like what we think, right? You look at out in the world and hate can sometimes be vandalism and you're like breaking people's stuff. You see people screaming at each other. You see people act of violence. Like we don't see that type of hate, right? You even see in other countries, people who hate Christians are literally putting them to death. So that's not the type of hate that we're seeing here. And I'm thankful for that, but that doesn't mean that we don't have hate in our own hearts, right? Well, what is this hate? It can be looking for the demise of others, right? So maybe this is with your sibling where it's like you go to your parents and you paint them in a bad light. So something happens bad to them and it works out better for you and you get the positive results of something. Maybe it's hoping that someone gets a bad grade on something so that they don't get recognition that you want to have. Hate can look a lot of different ways. But I think one of the biggest ways that we show hate for people is by not looking to build them up in Christ, right? If we're withholding the gospel, or if I'm doing things that are a stumbling block to others, that can be a form of hate that's not loving. The opposite of love is hate. If we go, so... Going back to 1 Corinthians 13, there's this whole list of things that love is this, love does this, love is this. If you look at the opposite and we see what is the opposite of love, we see that lo- that hate is cruel, right? You're just mean to people and it's hurtful. Maybe it's with your words and you say things that just cut. You know exactly the right button. You know right what to say just to make that person angry or hurt or cry because you just really want to get under their skin. That is cruelty, right? Hate is selfish, right? You're looking out for yourself. You don't care what happens to other people. You just care that it works out well for you, right? In adulthood, you see this with people with jobs all the time. People will lie about other people so that they look better, so that they can get a promotion, right? And I don't know if you guys experience this at school or with siblings, but people, when they're selfish, normally it doesn't work out well for you. Hate is boastful. Hate is proud. You're all about making yourself look good. Hate is rude. It insists on its own way. If there's two ways and your sibling's like, hey, I really want to do this, and you're like, I want to do this. I don't love them. I want to do things my way. That's hateful. You're not loving them. Love, or sorry, hate is irritable. Hate is resentful, right? Resentment. What is resentment? That's when someone did something wrong to you and then you just sit and you stew about that. You're like, I cannot believe that they did that. I want them to get what's coming to them, right? I feel like an easy example of this for older people is like when you're driving and someone cuts you off and then you're like, oh, that makes me so mad. And then you're just hoping that some police officer pulls them over and like you're resenting them. Like, I can't believe that. And maybe you try to swerve out in front of them and you're like slowing down and you're making them mad and you're like, hey, hey, now they're mad at me, but I got back at them, right? Or maybe we do that with, we, we get really petty, guys. We can do that in so many ways. Like maybe um, you get in trouble for something but then you do something just to get back at your siblings so that they get in trouble too and neither of you guys get to play video games or whatever it is. Or maybe you both have to go to bed early and you're just trying to get under their skin because you're resentful, right? Hate does not bear all things. Hate does not believe all things. If someone comes and says, hey, like, I'm really sorry. I'm trying to make things right. And you're like, you hate them. You're like, yeah, right. You've done this so many times. I don't believe you. And like, get away from me. Or I don't know. Hate is not enduring all things. Maybe someone does something just one time, you're like, oh, stop. Or maybe they do it two or three, and you're not long-suffering and bearing with them, right? Maybe 
someone does something that really annoys you 20 or 30 or 40 times, love is going to be patient and kind. And yeah, you may confront it with the truth, but because you care about their spiritual state, you care about them being like Christ, you care about them loving God, and because you love God, you're going to be patient, you're going to be kind, you're not going to be resentful towards them. If you have truly experienced God's glorious love, if you have truly loved God, if you truly love others, then you're not going to be hateful towards people, right? It is not characteristic for God's people. Christ did not die for you. He did not save you so that then you could go and be hateful to other people. He saved you so that you could love them, right? If you're truly in the light, if you're truly a follower of Christ, then you are convinced of how amazing God is and you love him. And as a result, you want others to love him. You want to, if you're truly convinced that God is the best thing, if you love God so much, then you're going to want other people to know him. You're going to want to do everything in your power to help them come to know God. And you're not going to want to get in the way, right? I don't know if, how, were you guys all at church this morning for the baptisms? It, were you guys there for second service? How many were there for second service? Okay, a decent number. Well, d- there was the last testimony. She said she went to one youth group, and she had her struggles and everything, and people were cruel to her and shaming her, and that pushed her away for a time, right? They were not doing everything in their power to love her. Maybe they were. We don't know. But I— it sounds like they were not doing everything in their power to love her and share the truth with her to help her come to know God, right? In ways, it sounds like it was hateful. They were shaming her, probably making fun of her, whatever, right? That's not what 1 John is describing of believers. If you truly love God and love others, you're going to do everything you can to, hey, let me grab you and just take you and come know God. He is amazing. I want you to love him, and this is what he's done in my life. I want him to do this in your life as well. So with that, let's go ahead and pray, and we're going to go look at our lives and how we can better love others. Dear Lord, we thank you for the love that you have shown us when we did not deserve it. We were your enemies, and you, because you cared about us and wanted us to be like Christ, you sent your Son to die for us. And Lord, I pray that we would be overflowing with gratitude and thankfulness for that love. And I pray that we would show that same love to others, because Lord, There are so many people who are dying without knowing you and give us a love for them that we would go and tell them the truth uh, so that they may know you. In Jesus' name.